as we continue 40 days of prayer. And hopefully you've been, if you've partaking of the, uh, your journal and the daily devotionals that are in there, I've heard many of you comment on that as far as uh, that being a real encouragement to you on a daily basis. Um, hopefully you're attending a life group and so you're processing with other people what you're seeing of course there's another teaching at life group a video uh, for visual learners and audio learners and so uh, some great stuff I know we had a great time this uh, last week at our life group and so today I want to ask you it's a little uh, in your bulletin there's a little sheet that's front and back and it's got a couple fill in the blanks it's got some important scriptures and so uh, we're going to look more at uh, how we talk to God, where the title is, Who Do You Think You're Talking To? Now, I don't know about you, but I heard that every once in a while as I grew up, particularly when I got to my teen years, and I would have opinions about things uh, in regard to my parents and how they did things, to which I would get the response from my mother or sometimes my father, Who do you think you're talking to? Right? Nobody else ever had that happen. Nobody else had that happen. I, I just feel like an outcast. All right, let's get on to it. You know, while we're just airing stuff about growing up, you know one of the things as I've been growing up that kind of irritates me, I'll just let you in on something, is when, you know, someone calls me. They, they call me and people call, you know how this is, they call you and they don't identify themselves. Now, I know we've got cell phones that tell you stuff. But I'm one of those guys that doesn't put everybody's contact because I like a little mystery. But there is that irritation when somebody calls and they just start talking and they're like, you ought to know who I am. And they're tell you're talking to you. I had somebody do that last night. It was a wrong number, by the way. <laughs> they asked me if I could come to the back door and let them in. Anyway, it's not my point. But when people call and, and, and on the other end and it affects your whole conversation when you don't know who it is and they just start talking to you and you don't know who it is and, and you don't know how to respond to them you don't know what you're going to say you're a little more guarded with your just like let, let you in the back door I mean uh, you don't know if it's the Pope or the pizza guy so you're clueless on this thing and so how we talk to people in regard to who we know it is is you know the, the, the appropriateness and and you don't know how to address people properly if you don't know the person on the other end. And so in regard to that, proximity and relationship determines how you talk to somebody. Really, how you talk to anybody. Proximity and relationship determines that. What you know about somebody determines your conversation. How you're... How you, what, you, you all with me on that one? Maybe your parents never said, who do you think you're talking to? But you know what I'm talking about there. Now... The same is true of God. And so as we talk today about another aspect of prayer, uh, the same is true with God. Uh, uh, and so the, there's a statement on your outline there this morning. It says this, Your understanding of what God is really like shapes everything else in your life, including how you pray. Your understanding of what God is really like shapes everything else in your life, including how you pray. So today, my hope, by the power of God's Spirit, that we'll kind of explode some misconceptions about God and how we even approach or talk to Him. Uh, and so that's my heart and desire. It's been my prayer too. Nothing influences our life more than, than, than how we view God. So some of us have different ways. I don't, you've probably talked to people, and there are misconceptions, and you don't want to just say, that's really dumb. But when people say, like, um, you know, I think God is just grumpy, cranky all the time. I think he's just, a, you know, he's just, he's upset all the time, and you can never please God. There's people who think of God that way. There's people who think of God as the crouching tiger God, who's just waiting to pounce on you when you just kind of step out of line. You, maybe you're one of those people. Maybe you know people like that. Uh, there's, there's the people who have the misconception of the flaky father God. I mean, he's moody, he changes his mind continually, he says something one day, and he does something different the next. And, and so, you know, uh, there's that kind of a thing. There's the cosmic cop God, you know, waiting for, to hit you over the head. There's people who think of God that way. It's not good. It's a misconception. 
And then there's this one. This is the one that seems to be really popular in our culture today. It's the Play-Doh God or the Mr. Potato Head God. And that means we make him up to be what we want him to be. We just mold him and shape him or put the things on. And what we typically do, what we typically do, speaking, is we want to make him in our image. And yet clearly scripture says God made us in his image. And so these are, these are misconceptions. And then people go, well, you know, I like to think of God. Uh, you know what? It doesn't make any difference what you, your opinion is of God. What makes a difference is what God says about himself. Amen? And so we're going to talk about that a little bit this morning. When it comes to God, it, it, it's what he's really like, not what you think of. So it's extremely important that we know the real God. A.W. Tozer is a little, uh, 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 I posted one of those few things on Facebook yesterday that I felt like was worthwhile. And it's this quote from Tozer, A.W., Aiden Wilson Tozer. What comes to your mind when you think about God is the most important thing about you. I want you to think about that a minute. What comes to your mind when you think about God is the most important thing about you because it affects everything else in your life. That's why our view of God is so important. You know, so what is God really like? Well, there's many characteristics. Uh, theologically, we use the term attributes, right? Uh, attributes of God. Uh, he's all-knowing, omniscient. He's uh, all-powerful. He's omnipotent. We, we sang songs this morning that spoke of his omnipotence and, and his omniscience. And, and, and he just knows everything. He's omnipresent, which just blows my mind. All of us struggle with that because that means he's everywhere all the time at all times. Future, past. He's, he's, he's everywhere. God is holy, which is a concept I cannot grasp in my natural mind, and neither can you. You might think you can, but he's holy, and he's just, and, and he's righteous, and he's loving, and God just doesn't have love. God is love. You can read that in 1 John. God is faithful. Even when we are faithless, we read a little bit about that this past week in Life Group, and we talked about it last Sunday a little bit. So the only reason there's any good in the world at all is because of God. You can't spell good without God. I had a whole row of grade schoolers in the first service, and I, yeah, and they spelled for me. Uh, and anyway, you get the point. You cannot spell good without God. We can't have good in the world if there is not a good God who has put things in motion. There's a scripture there. Uh, we're going to look at four things this morning about prayer, but there's a scripture there in Psalm 100 verse 5 it's the living bible paraphrase uh, you can read it in your favorite version and i believe god will still speak to you the same truth the lord is always good say that with me the lord is always good he's always loving and kind and his faithfulness goes on and on to each succeeding generation if you don't catch anything else today if we just stop right there that should affect how we approach god in prayer quite frankly but let me just give you a few pointers. Because God is always good, number one, on your outline. God's plans for my life will always be good. God's plans for my life will always be good. And some of you are already thinking, well, that, no, I mean, you don't know where I am. You don't know my circumstance right now and what's going on and the tragedy. And, but God's plans for your life, for my life, will always be good. That's just who he is. People say, you know, is there anything God can't do? Yes, he can't deny himself, and, and, and he can't do evil. And there's maybe another thing or two, but that's all that comes to my mind. But God is always good. Now, I want you to look at the scripture, Jeremiah 29, 11. We looked at this about four weeks ago in context. We talked about Jeremiah 29 uh, as the people of God. But just here's this verse. I know what I have planned for you. This is the New Century Version. I know what I have planned for you says the Lord. I have good plans for you, not plans to hurt you. My plans will give you a hope and a good future. And there, there's that word good again. And when you call to me and you pray, I will listen to you. I want you to see the connection there between the purpose that God has and prayer. My purpose for you is good. My plans are for hope and for a future and oh, by the way, that should just go ahead and cause you to want to talk to me when you come to me and pray. Right there it is. E even in the Old Testament, there's a connection. And that's said 
times in the past that you're not an accident. That in God's goodness, you are not an accident. There, there might be unplanned pregnancies, but you are not an accident. God knew your days before there was one of them, Scripture says. And I believe what he says. And, and, and so, uh, and God didn't have to create a plan for your life. You know, because he's, he's sovereign and, and, and omniscient and omnipotent and all those omnis, that he knew what he had for you. Now, he gives us choice. We'll talk about that in just a little bit. But he didn't have to create a plan for you. God has never made anything on the planet that didn't have a purpose. Probably even mosquitoes. I don't understand them. But, but and, and God calls us. He, he wants us to know about his goodness, so we'll approach him in prayer. And, and, and we'll allow him in our conversation his word our conversation by his spirit to reveal more of his plan for us people say i wish i knew god's plan well start right where you are it's not that you know there's a place in the psalms that says thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path i think we talked about that a while back it's not a spotlight it's steps of faith every day but god will reveal but that's why he desires so strongly that we spend time with him, that we would, we would come and desire that conversation. David says, and you can write this down, it's not on your outline and, and uh, it's not behind me, but Psalm 31, 19, God, your goodness is so great. David just says, God, your goodness is so great. Everything good in your life is a gift from God. God, your goodness is so great and you have stored up Great blessings for those who honor you, who fear you, who revere your name. Different translations say it different ways. He stored up. Notice that. He's got a plan. He's intentional about storing up blessings for you. And you do so much for those who come to you for, your, you for protection. Blessing them before a watching world. Remember, the ultimate blessing is turning us from our way and turning us his way. The, uh, uh, the fulfillment, the, uh, the infusion of the character of God is the greatest blessing. It's not all the stuff we can get. It's all of God that he wants to give us. So just a thought. That's why we're doing 40 days of prayer. I want God to bless your life before a watching world. We are called to be witnesses. All authority was given to him so that we would be witnesses to those around us in our prayer life discerning, aligning ourselves with his word and then discerning his direction for us, his purpose for us and walking that out in obedience is what allows the people around us in the good times and the bad. We'll talk more about that. So God says, everything I do in your life is good. I don't have bad plans for you. People say, well, you know, God's getting even with me when something goes wrong. No, God does not get even with you. God does not get even with you. It's, it, it, we live with circumstances because of choices we make, but God does not get even with you. It's just the way it is. His desire is to just reveal. Listen, God is not mad at you. Somebody's here this morning, and you think, well, God's mad at me because this happened or X, Y, or Z happened. God is, not, God is not mad at you. He's mad about you. It was his great love. It's his kindness and his goodness that leads us to repentance, Scripture says in the New Testament. So even if you had to hit rock bottom, which did not feel good, it's out of his goodness and his plan. Am I right? It's true. You might not believe it yet. See, we live on a broken planet. People say, how, how could God plan all this good stuff when we live with all this sinful stuff going on and people blowing stuff up and wars and rumors of wars and all because God has given us choice to do what we want to do. His desire and his plan is that we would follow him. I don't know anybody that follows him perfectly. Do you? Don't, don't poke your neighbor. And there's people who don't even care a thing about God. And they're doing whatever they want to do. And the result is brokenness, fallenness, sinfulness. All the more reason. If we've been called into a relationship with Jesus, why not take him at his word and and participate through prayer. Sin's messed everything up, but God still has a plan, even in the middle of all the brokenness. I mean, think about it. The God of the universe sent his son, and he can turn crucifixion, what looked to be the end of everything, into resurrection. He is a God of restoration and reconciliation. 
and new beginnings. Romans 8, 28. Okay, pop culture quiz. Did anybody watch the TV show last week, Manifest? Never mind. (laughs) I did, and it all revolved around the numbers 828. It was a flight number and so on. And then this gal who survives, her mother keeps saying, God works all things together for good. But she didn't complete it. And later, this is crazy. This is a this is a network show. Later, the girl goes to a church and gets a Bible because she doesn't have one and looks up Romans 8.28. And they show it right there on the screen for everybody to see. God works all things together for the good for those who love him and called according to his purposes. Now, obviously, they didn't preach on it. And the show went on. It was weird. So don't, don't bother. But I was just shocked to see that in there. But it's one of those scriptures we can take out of context just like I know the plans I have for you. But here's the deal. God causes everything to work together for the good of those who love God and are called according to purpose. Does everything mean everything in scripture? Okay. So even the bad stuff, right? Okay. All right. He can take all the things. He's not wanting you to go out and just do bad stuff, but he can take the things that have happened in your life that are not good with all the other stuff. Anybody ever bake a cake from scratch? I have not, but I've seen it done. (laughs) And so, here's the deal. Our life is just like the cake ingredients for the batter. You, you, You take stuff that you wouldn't normally eat by itself, like flour. Hey, I'm craving something good to eat. Let me go up and get some flour out of the... no. No, or, or, or cooking oil. Yeah, let me go have a swig of that. that. No. Raw eggs? I mean, seriously, there's probably somebody in the room that thinks that's great, but uh-uh. No, no, no. Vanilla. You're not going to drink vanilla straight up. That's nastiness. Maybe the sugar, but even that by itself is overwhelming. None of those ingredients by themselves you're going to eat, but when you mix them together with the creativity God gave you or the recipe, That cake batter, with the bitter and the bland and the sweet, that batter comes out incredible when you bake it. And the end result is this cake. It's awesome, hopefully. Here's the deal. It's not hopefully with God. It's the real deal with God. He takes the good, the bad, the ugly. He takes all things and works them together for good. And might I say this, and I'll say it again, probably before we are done, for his glory, for his glory. It's not just about your good. Thank God that he is good good oh oh. but he's also doing things for the purpose of revealing his glory to a a, a world that's looking on so that he'll be magnified you know the story of joseph in the bible if you don't uh, he was a guy that was highly favored by his dad his brothers didn't like it they got jealous they made some bad choices they sold him and they were going to kill him they put him into slavery and gave him to a nation which all of a sudden over a period of years God works and now he's second command of Egypt crazy God works all things together and then his brothers who sold him into slavery who most of us would want to choke in the midst of a famine they come and he says this Genesis 50 20 your plan was to hurt me guys they're expecting to be annihilated And he just says, your plans was to do me harm, to hurt me. But God turned your evil plans into a good plan to save the lives of not just me, but many. See, sometimes you suffer for the benefit of other people. And God uses that. I mean, think about it. If Jesus hadn't come and died on the cross, that's called redemptive suffering. And we're called in his image. You don't go out and look for it. But if we take what God gives us and walk it out, You never know what God's going to do with it for his glory. And so, God never wastes a hurt. I heard some really good stuff here at CR the other night from some gal that was giving her testimony. It was really good. And uh, a couple of you were here. The more you trust the goodness of God, the more joy you're going to have in your life. Romans 5, 3, so we can rejoice when we run into all kinds of problems and trials, for we know, it says, for we know that they are good for us. They help us learn patient endurance. That's what Paul tells us. Let me jump ahead. 
Number two, God always gives me what I need and what, not what I deserve. How many of you could say, thank you, God, for that? God always gives me what I need, not what I deserve. Not what I deserve. That, that, that's, that's just what he does. Psalm 103 says this, verse 10, 12. God has not treated us as we deserve. He's not, think about that. When I think about what I deserve, well, that'd be the end of me. For our sins, what I deserve for our sins or paid us back for our wrongs. Because Jesus Christ paid for our sins. That's the good news of the new, new, new covenant. All of our wrongs, all of our guilt, all of our shame. He's taken our sins away and removed them as far as the east is from the west. You ever stopped and wondered? I used to think this. Why does God always deal with the east and the west? Why does he never say he's taken them from the north to the south? Anybody know? Because north and south has an ending. There's a north pole and a south pole. There's a beginning and an end. There is no beginning and end of east and west. And that's what he wants us to know. He takes them. They're gone. They're gone. God is good. And we don't get what we deserve. I mean, you think about King David, a man after God's own heart out of the Old Testament. I mean, King David, first he commits adultery, and he's not where he's supposed to be. That's how he gets in that spot. And people say, how's that happen? How do you fall in the... Because you're not where you're supposed to be. He was not where he's supposed to be. And then to cover that up, he has a guy murdered, her husband. Commits adultery. And then, see, these, these are big sins. These, these get the big list, right? And, and, and they're right at the top. Did David deserve to be forgiven? Come on, just use your own justice. No. Oh, my goodness. And we do this to each other. When somebody does something stupid, well, they deserve that. Psalm 51, 1 and 2. God, in your goodness, have mercy on me. See, that's the advantage we have when we come and talk to God. God, in your goodness, have mercy on me. Not because I deserve it, but because you're a good God. Have mercy on me. Wash away all my guilt and make me clean again from my sin. Cleanse me. That should move us toward prayer right there. Because God is good. All the time, and all the time God is good. That's where Cody was going a little bit ago, and we just were not quick to pick it up. Make this real clear. God forgives you, not because you're good. God forgives you not because you're good, but because he's good. I mean, if, I think you're going to get the point today. Psalm 27, 10 through 13, even if my father and mother abandon me, the one who on the planet that's, that God put us with that would love us the most, even if they abandon me, even if they abandon me, my father and my mother, the Lord will hold me close. Do you see the tenderness in that verse? My enemies are waiting for me to fall. But I remain confident that I will see the goodness of the Lord while I'm in the land of the living. Why? Because God's good. Because God is always good. When we pray, we can always be bold and we can be confident. We can't be arrogant, but we can be bold and confident as we come and we we lay our petitions before him and we just lay ourselves out. We don't come slinking into God. As a matter of fact, Hebrews 4, 15 and 16, uh, talking about Jesus, it says that he understands our weaknesses. He understands our weaknesses. For he faced all the same temptations we do. Can you believe that? Oh, no, he didn't face. It says he faces everything that we do. same temptation yet he did not sin thank God because he paid for mine he paid for yours he paid for the sin of the whole world as a result of, of his obedience to the father so let us because of this because he faced all the same temptations and, and he did not sin let us come boldly with confidence to the throne of our gracious and might I say good God there we receive his mercy that goodness will be poured out and, and we will find the grace to help us when we need it. That's why we've got to come to him. That's why if we don't understand his good, we'll just always have those misconceptions about the crouching tiger God and all that. No, no, no. He's a good God and he invites us to come.
Come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Let me just move on to the third point. God puts my good above his own good. Think about that. That's almost confusing. God puts, you hear, check this out. God puts my good, your good, above his own good. Because God's always good, he does that. This is the good news. This is, this, is, this is the essence of the gospel. This is not like any of the movies we go see where there's a king and then there's all these knights that are sworn to protect the king and they go let kill themselves or be killed on behalf of the king, right? This is a to- totally different storyline. We have a good king. All power and authority is his and he lays his life down for the peasants. That's a deal. Matter of fact, that's a great exchange. Matter of fact, the goodness of God, he wants to pour into us. He has taken the sin. He's taken the evil if we'll confess it to him and ask for forgiveness. And the great exchange is my guilt, shame, and mess for his righteousness. Oh, the other word for righteousness is his goodness. And you go, well, no, that's really nice. How do you know that? Uh, well, I'm the good shepherd. I'm the good shepherd. I know my sheep by name, and they know me, and I will sacrifice my life for them. That tells you something. John 15, 13, the greatest love that you can have is lay your life. Listen, you'll never lay down your life. And when I say, you know, when we, we love our children, and there's a point in time where we go, you know what, I'd give my life for them. And we're talking in the literal. And God just asked us to do this among each other as family, as his family, as brothers and sisters of Christ and in Christ to just sometimes let our preference, sometimes not just bow up and get our way. Matter of fact, marriages would go a whole lot better if we'd learn to serve one another and take this goodness that God wants to give us so that we begin to yield and it takes both parties doing it. Wives, submit to your husbands and husband, lay your life down for your wife. If you just start with that, but that's the way it's supposed to work in the body as well. Not because they deserve it, but because the goodness of God is worth revealing. And it brings glory to his name. He imputes his goodness, that word impute, gives to. He puts it in us. And we can grow in righteousness and in graciousness. He's designed it that way, that we'd respond. I mean, it's better than when, in, I don't, is it Wayne Brady that does Let's Make a Deal now? I'm not up on all my pop culture. Mont, Monty Hall. Let's make a deal. You want this box? You want this? Christ has come. The king has come and laid down his life with no mystery. It's not door number one, door number two. It's, I will give you forgiveness and my righteousness, and I will take all your guilt and shame and sorrow and garbage. It's the greatest exchange. That's the best deal you're ever going to get right there and it comes by grace it comes by his goodness matter of fact if it weren't for his goodness do you think lightly Romans says Paul writes in Romans 2 or do you think lightly of the riches of his kindness or his goodness and tolerance and patience not knowing that kindness the goodness of God leads us to turn around to repentance even as hard as it was when you came to that place and you hit bottom and you said, wait a minute, there's got to be a better way. It's because of his goodness and his kindness that leads us to repentance. He won't strong arm us. He'll let us make that decision. But he does everything to reveal his goodness to us. Jesus Christ died on a cross. He solved the biggest problem that we, any of us have. That's death. He conquered death. And he gave us grace to carry on the battle against the enemy on the planet. We did an exchange in this covenant thing. His enemies are now my enemies, but he took on the biggest one. And if I can be free from the fear of death, anything else that comes into my life really should look like small potatoes. I'm talking theoretically here. Because whatever the problem is in front of us usually gets the big headline, right? But Jesus came and took care of an eternity situation for us by his death burial and resurrection great exchange number four very quickly we talked about last week so I'm not going to go into depth but he does not say yes to every request if you weren't here last week go back and watch it it will save us time today 
God answers this yes, no, wait, or are you got to be kidding me, right? Uh, and, and, but he answers, he answers, but he doesn't give us everything. There's not a good father on the planet that gives his child everything. First of all, he can't afford it, and secondly, it wouldn't be good for them. And he does the same thing with us. That's what makes him good. That's why we can sing that song. Not just because it's got a nice melody and a nice groove to it. He's a good, good father. Because he is. But he doesn't say yes to every request. There's some scriptures that go along there, uh, you know, talking about us on the planet being uh, fathers that from a sinful, broken place. We won't even give our kids stuff they don't need. We'll give them what they need and what they're asking for. And so on. And then just this reminder of Isaiah 55, 8 and 9. My thoughts are completely different than yours. When we can't understand why God's not giving me what I'm asking for at the moment, we have to be reminded of the bigger picture. My thoughts are completely different from yours. And my ways are far beyond anything you could even imagine. That's good. Because I, I wouldn't want to serve a God that just I could figure out. I don't know about you. Some of us want to figure out everything, but there's some of the great things about God is just the mystery. For just as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts higher than your thoughts. God does not always say yes to every request. And then lastly, lastly, is that he invites us to live with him forever. This is amazing in the goodness of God. He invites us to live with him forever and ever. God wants you in his goodness, not because you deserve it, but in his goodness, not just while you're here on earth, but for eternity, which is something I can't wrap my mind around at all. Living forever and ever. Not only abundant life does he offer through the Son, but eternal life through the Son. Best deal ever. His righteousness for our sin and shame. A couple verses. Second Thessalonians. Um, 2 Thessalonians 2, 16 and 17. Our Lord Jesus Christ and God our Father who loves us has given us by His grace, by His very goodness, an everlasting encouragement. I'd say so. Everlasting. It never ends. And a good hope. Here it is. Good. A good hope that will last forever. last forever may this encourage your heart the writer of Thessalonians says and give you strength for every good thing you do and say eternity heaven we haven't talked about that much you know that that's an area that for us as believers we we got over focused maybe a century or so ago because we just wanted to get out of here and now we seem to, we've bought the gospel that says everything's good here while I'm here. And so we don't look towards heaven. But I want to tell you something. It's not all good here. But because God's good, he takes all things and works them together for our good and for his glory. But there's an eternity where every tear will be wiped away. Where sorrow and suffering, it says in the Old Testament, will flee away. Because the redeemed of the Lord will return. It's a good hope for us. Psalm 23. Everybody knows the 23rd Psalm. But that last verse, verse 6, says, Surely goodness, surely goodness, God's goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life. This is one who knew a good shepherd. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever and ever and ever. He invites us through this covenant through the blood of Christ, through the goodness and the graciousness of God, to be with Him forever. As we look at things in our small group, as we talk about things in light of the circumstance right now, and they're real, and they really do hurt and grief and all that stuff, but when we look at this last point, because out of His goodness, surely goodness will follow me all the days of my life. And I'll dwell in the house. I'll dwell in the dwelling place of God face to face where I can just be in his presence forever and ever and ever. Where does that come from? His goodness. His goodness. It's an amazing thing. 
my sin for his righteousness. He's a good God, so I can approach him. I can come confidently. All these things we've been talking about today should encourage us to go toward God, not run away from him. May the spirit of the living God help us to, that he would blow up all the misconceptions that we've put together about who we think God is based on whatever we were using to get there. But may we see him, the great attribute of God, not that one's bigger than the other, but, but the one we need to know right here on the planet, that God is good all the time. And all the time God is good. And by golly, I think we'll begin to approach him. We'll come boldly. We'll come with a confidence before him and begin to have conversation. And his word won't be something we just go study and drudgery over, but we'll delight in his word. Delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires. He's going to change the desires of your heart. And that's what prayer is for that we be transformed by the renewing of our mind. His word, his spirit, his voice. And that comes when we seek him out. I want you to pray this week with me and with others. Psalm 119, verses 37 and 40. And here it is. Lord, keep me from paying attention to what's worthless. So probably some of the pop culture references I just made, God keep me from paying attention to what's worthless this week I don't know what it will be for you but, but asking for that help keep me from paying attention to what's worthless instead let me live by your word let me feed on delight in meditate on your word in our small groups in our personal time in our home and, and, and then it goes on I want you I want to obey your principles. Please renew my life with your goodness. With your goodness. Renew my life with your goodness. So, I want to ask you to join me this week as we ask him to renew my life, your life, with his goodness. That we do and pray for three different things. Lord, revive my heart. According to this scripture, Psalm 119. Keep that outline if you need it. Look it up in your own Bible. Keep me from worthless stuff. Let me live by your word. I want to obey your principles. Please renew my life with your goodness. Let's pray, pray that God would revive our own hearts this week with intentionality. That he would revive our small groups. I love, our, I love my small group that meets at my house. I love that group. And I think there's some thriving going on. But I don't think it's wrong to go ahead and say, God, continue to revive, renew. Make us see things we haven't seen yet. Help us to see you, Jesus, in, in your fullness. So pray for yourself that God would revive your heart, that he would revive or bring freshness to and renewal to your life group. And then one more, maybe two more. Revive us as a fellowship. Revive us, renew us as a fellowship. Are we, are we doing bad? No. But God is good, and there's so much more. So can we not ask him for that? And then God, bring renewal and revival to the church of Sharon. Not just a group that meets here. Not, not just a group that meets down the street or over here down the road, but for your body in this town. We could even go national. We can go global. I mean, we're praying to the God, the king, who has all power and authority in heaven and earth, right? But what if we just start with renew my heart, renew my life group, and renew this fellowship? And if he takes you farther, go for it. That's what I say. Stand with me this morning. I want to pray, and, and, and then just as we would leave here this morning, that we would remember the big attribute that helps us, that calls us on into the place of prayer, that place of conversation with God. His goodness. Just bow your heads with me this morning. Let's just dwell on His goodness. Father, You are good. You're a good Father. I'm grateful for the song, but it doesn't change the reality that's been since eternity past. Lord, there's those here this morning that may be in pain, uncertainty, and You're still a good, good Father. We've all had prayers that weren't answered in the way that we wanted them to be answered but you're still good. Lord, would you help us remember that, that your 
plan for our lives is always good. So we choose your plan. We choose to believe you, your word, not ours. Help us, oh God, remember that you're, you always give us what we need. And thank you. It's not what we deserve. Thank you for that. Thank you. You not only forgive us, but you pour your goodness into us. You impute your righteousness. Thank you. Thank you that you're not mad at us, that you're mad about us. You love us. It was because of your great love that you came and laid your life down. Thank you that that you amazingly put your good above our own good in this great exchange through the cross and resurrection, the dying for your sheep. You didn't spare your own son. Thank you, Lord. And Lord, even though we don't always understand it, we thank you. We thank you that you don't even say yes all the time to everything that we come to you with. Lord, your, your goal, I believe your heart, oh God, is to make us look more like Jesus, not to make our lives easy, but to grow us up. And your thoughts aren't our thoughts, and you do it differently than us. But Lord, in your goodness, we are choosing to trust you. Renew my heart. Renew our life groups and renew us as a fellowship here at Cornerstone. Those that are here today, those that aren't here today, or those that call this their house of worship, I pray, Jesus, that you would just bring freshness and renewal out of your righteousness and out of your goodness, O oh God. We're believing. We're asking. Lord, make us quick to listen, O oh God, and, and, and prepare our hearts to obey because it's our obedience to what you ask us to do that really reveals your love and your goodness to others. Lord, for our good the good plans the hope and for your glory Lord reveal your heart to us and to those around us through us as your sons and daughters adopted because of the blood of the new covenant we thank you just sing this song that Deanne's playing together here God you're so good makes him approachable he's good God, you're so good. God, you're so good. You're so good to me. God, you're so God answers prayer because of his goodness. Let's sing that. God answers prayer. God answers prayer. God answers prayer. God answers prayer. He's so bless you keep you make his face shine upon you that the nations will know the people around about will know that he is God and we're not but he is let's go be the church amen renew my heart renew my life group renew our church as a whole amen let's pray it together amen amen amen